Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation, you can type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to Crop Talk for June the 5th. And uh, I guess this uh, spring seeding has created a lot of issues for uh, producers, uh, whether it be uh, we got off to an early start, then we got some slow growth, we get bugs, and we're getting reseeding. So I thought we would concentrate one more time on some of the questions that are out there in the field right now. and uh, one of them is uh, assessing the, your cereal crop stand out there right now. There's a, a lot of producers that are uh, been watching their canola crops really close and haven't been maybe keeping a, as close an eye on some of their cereal crops. So we're starting to get some questions on some of those earlier seeded cereal crops that just uh, aren't coming up and some of the later ones that uh, are sitting in dry soil. So I thought I'd get Rajon Picard to give us a little bit of a, a, a talk today regarding assessing the sand, what we should be looking for when we're out there, and uh, what, what, what actually is a good stand for cereals. After that, uh, I got John Gavlowski to come back on again. Um, flea beetles and cutworms seems to be uh, still causing a lot of issues for producers out there. And I thought it'd be good for John to give us an update as to what he's been seeing over the last week, as well as uh, how long these uh, these guys are going to be around. So with that, Laurie, I think we'll uh, give it over to Rajon, and he'll start the, uh, the webinar today. Good morning. Can you hear me? You bet, Rajon. Very good, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Assessing your cereal crop stand, the reseed question. Lionel asked me to talk about this here today, and uh, I wasn't sure where that was coming from because typically cereals are usually get planted first thing in the spring, fairly early. Moisture is not too much of an issue. Soils are cool to cold, and so usually cereals have a pretty good start uh, before other issues start to develop. But let's take a look to see here if things do happen, what we need to do, what we should be considering here. So uh, so a bit of an overview here. So we'll take a look at some of the, the do a, do a, how to do it as a, a damage assessment. I'll look at the popula plant population assessment itself, uh, timing of receding and some other issues, the economics of receding, recropping options and receding itself. So first, uh, this is a picture I took this morning by my place. Uh, this is probably one of the later cereal fields plant planted in my area. So we have a, a good start. As I mentioned before, we had a, a frost about 10 days ago, uh, not, not, an imp not impacting cereals here to, to, uh, to any degree really what, what we've had. So again, so we have a good start here for this uh, cereal field, not dry. Again, good uniform emergence. And so if I look more closely, oh, let me show up as I wanted to. Oh yeah, this is, oh yeah, this is another field here, the, close by to my place again, but this one was planted quite a bit earlier this spring, one of the first ones planted. Again, really good start, uh, good tillering happening, good uniform plant stand. And uh, the field's already been sprayed. We can see some tracks down the field. So again, very un nice uniform stand here coming along very nicely. Uh, but it it does or it can happen that sometimes can be compaction, can be some other issues here. So this is not a slide from this year, from a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, so sometimes a, a cereal stand can have some, <clears throat> excuse me, emergence issues. As we can see here, this looks as probably some compaction issue here from 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 machinery could be a heavy rain crusting or whatever it might be. So so in places it's possible that the stand could be thinner and more challenged. So damage assessment, okay, so we need to look at the, depending on the crop type and emergence, and this morning we're talking about cereals mostly. Uh, some things that can impact, again, uh, or can be causes, I guess, for further damage could be related to moisture, temperature, could be physical, like, like hail or soil crusting and, and things like that. 
uh, seating itself, uh, uh, what about speed could be an issue sometimes, uh, uh, the seating depth itself, uh, the seed bed preparation itself, seed bed quality. Um, those might be some of the reasons why. What about seed quality might be uh, an issue, or maybe not. Uh, that's something to consider. Uh, seeding rate itself is it is it high enough? Is it uh, is it thin? Has been has, you know has there been some other issues with that as well? Is it because of pests such as insects or disease? Uh, is it because of herbicide residues potentially from from last year? Depending on the growing conditions the year before and the breakdown of of herbicides can be an issue in terms of residue this following year. And also the landscape position of the damage itself. Sometimes a high versus a lower or mid low mid slope position can have uh, different conditions that may lead to to issues and again that may be related to some of the some of the factors just listed above and also wildlife damage can also be an issue <clears throat> so two types of germination quickly depending on the type of crop you have cereals typically the growing point stays below but in terms of the epigeal germination is the cotyledons emerge out of the soil during germination and that's mostly and actually Specifically for broadleaf crops, uh, with this type of have this type of germination, including alfalfa, canola flax, uh, soybeans, and some of those other ones. So frost and mechanical damage are concerns during emergence with these crops because damage to the growing point above ground may result in death of the plant. Hypogeal germination is where the cotyledons remain below the soil. So broadleaf crops that germinate this way, and there's some, there's field peas, faba beans, and lentils, so they're more protected, again, from, from elements like frost or, or hail or, and, and things like that. Uh, uh, grass types of crops are all this type uh, of germination and, is, and are better protected from frost, again, and mechanical damage. And usually regrowth occurs from the growing point below ground from those crops and typically recovers fairly well, or at least better than the other type of germination. So this is a, a representation here of the epigeal and the hypogeal. Again, epigeal, the growing point comes above ground, as we see here with the epi, epicotyle. And if, if this growing point is damaged here or cut off below the growing point, that plant is dead. With the hypogeal, if there's damage to the plant above ground, uh, new growth will continue and, and will, will emerge from, from below ground. So that's so there's again a much more protected type of a plant here for at the germination. Uh, not okay. This is from last year, just to show. This is a soybean field that was hit hard with uh, hail June the 14th. And again, that type of germination it has. The growing point is above ground. Those plants were basically sheared right off below the growing point, as we can see here with this close up. And there was no potential of regrowth. Those plants were dead. So simple decision must have to, must be receded in the case of cereals here this is again the same uh, same storm july uh, june 3, 14th last year this is a cereal field i think this was an oat field severely damaged but even already at that point we can see some some green tissue still remaining and potentially regrowing a lot of the dead materials on the ground and this is the same field here actually this is a picture from the edge of the field in the ditch and in the foreground, we see the the grass um, uh, actually from the from the ditch itself, which is a perennial grass. And what's what's green and up ahead there, we can see that's a, that's the old field that's regrowing very well, very rapidly because again that growing point was protected below ground at still at that point, and provided for a fairly quick recovery. Amazingly to me is that in the foreground that uh, forage plant, that perennial grass, is also relatively well, well protected but it, it took much longer to recover so plant population okay so you need to evaluate the current plant population or whatever may be left for uh, after an event or a situation where you, you're looking at or considering reseeding so again plant population target is specific to the crop that you're planting and also you want to compare the plant population that to what you might have left uh, using uh, yeah to, to potential yield using established charts like with crop insurance or MESC insurance. So here's an example here. This is what crop insurance uses for to, to assess the crop yield potential. And, and this is what you'd wanna do if your cereal field or cereal crop is challenged at the beginning of the year before the plant is heading out. <clears throat> so depending on the crop, there's a tailoring factor 
is a number of tillers to bushels per acre factor, and you multiply that by the number of plants that are found per square meter once you do some plant counts, and it will give you a bushels per acre potential. And so depending on that number, you will be that will give you some information whether is it worth keeping or should I decide and, and, and recede or, or reestablish uh, the crop here. So here's some plant population levels. Typically here for hardwood spring wheat, here we're looking at a normal plant stand, 23 to 28 plants per square foot. We'll multiply that by 10 per square meter. Uh, oats is a little bit less, barley about the same range. Uh, canola here is a, not, a, not a cereal crop, but I just thought I'd put that in. And in terms of the low range or the low end of the scale here, in terms of the plant, plant stand, plant population that you'd want to where you'd be considering whether you should recede or not, uh, NDSU suggests uh, between 8 to 14 plants per square foot or 80 to 140 per square meter, you'd be getting into the point where, yeah, you might, you would be reconsidering uh, reseeding because of, of uh, plant, you know, plant stand issues and low yield potential. Just want to show you here, this is 2017 wheat yield versus plant population work done here at the Manitoba Diversification Centers. And the plant population here varied from 15 plants per square foot to 39 plants per square foot. This is at four diversification centers in Manitoba. And you can see that uh, within each uh, uh, the diversification center location, and this is replicated randomized uh, trials, uh, the, the yield is relatively not that far off from the low end to the high end of that plant population. So, <clears throat> so I think below that 15, I think that's where we would probably start to see some yield penalty, a yield decline more so. But uh, generally speaking, in that plant stand range, it seems to be fairly consistent. Timing. So when you, so you have to look at okay, where are you in terms of receding timeline? If you're looking at another crop and yield potential of the receded crop, and also do you have to wait before receding to prevent the pest transfer? Sometimes uh, an, an example here would be, or could be the green bridge in the winter wheat spring wheat uh, rotation. If a winter wheat has to be terminated, uh, you need to to look at a. a, a a delay, a time delay of a, around 10 days of a terminated winter wheat crop before replanting to a spring crop that might be also uh, might be infected by this uh, by this mite that carries a virus that could infect the spring wheat. So, again, some things to consider depending on the crop. Just thought I'd mention that as an example. Uh, so, in terms of timing, so now again, you've seen this chart before. This is uh, from Manitoba Crop Insurance. It shows the the yield potential over time, uh, depending on the seeding date of these different crops. And right now we're in that first week of June. So the yield potential for reseeding anything is substantially less than what we would be if we're at that earlier part of May. So especially with cereals, uh, spring seeded cereals like wheat, oats and barley, uh, cool season crops, they benefit they, uh, you know, greatly from the earlier uh, cooler conditions to get established and so on. Also avoid uh, the higher temperatures potentially at flowering time and so on. So, so right now we'd be probably in that below. If we look at um, oats, for instance, in that first week we're below 80% of yield potential. So that's uh, to recede now a crop like that. Again, you're taking a severe, severe yield penalty if you were to to do something like that. Uh, the economics of receding, okay, so you have to look at the cost of receding, the revenue potential uh, of what you have now and what you might have also, and look at what would be the net benefit expected. <clears throat> and uh, there is actually a pretty good a new tool that was developed here by our team of farm management here within Manitoba Agriculture, and it's called the Crop Receding Decision Tool. And there's a web link there below, uh, or you can simply search it on the internet under that particular title. And that uh, tool is based on an Excel spreadsheet. So most of most people that have computers will be able to download it and use that spreadsheet. It's free to download. And so here you, it's a it's a drop down menu. Here I'm, uh, in my in this area here. This is based on by risk area. So where I am located, it's risk area five. So on the right side of that box, you you would select the the risk area that you're in. And then then the, the soil zone that you're in, the crop insurance coverage that you have, 
Uh, you can also adjust your individual productivity index, and this will calculate your uh, MASC probable yield, which is a 10-year 10 10 long-term average yield. Uh, the current market price estimate was 667, and the potential receded crop, uh, just to put canola, uh, you, I left the, the, the IPI at one, and the market price at 10, 9, 1081. So if I did a plant and I simply just put one plant count here on the, the and this is per uh, plants per square meter, so at a 140 plants per square meter, which is getting at the lower end of the the adequate range, you might say in terms of plant plant stand, uh, it's calculating at 28.6 bushels to the acre and a revenue of 190 dollars and 50 cents. So now if I recede, in, and I currently I would be in the first week of June, and again, it's drop down menu, you can adjust that uh, because of the, uh, the later planting time that as opposed to the less favorable time with, with canola versus the ideal time, there's a bit of a, a yield factor penalty. So the estimated recede yield, if conditions would be appropriate for germination and the rest of it okay, it would be at 39.5. There's some costs related to receding and so on, indemnity payments and so on. So estimated gross revenue 426, or an estimated benefit cost of receding decision $235.87, which would be beneficial and worthwhile doing according to this. Now my next, uh, uh, I guess, a simulation here, I put uh, instead of receding canola here, I would recede with, I think this was wheat actually, yeah. And so if you were to recede with wheat, uh, yeah, the, ben the estimated benefit versus cost, it would only be 128. So not as beneficial as the other option of receding to canola. But again, so you can play with that. You can change some of those factors and look at what, 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 uh, what options and what uh, economic you know, benefit and cost there is to you. So again, some other considerations uh, to to this to uh, to look at is uh, what was the previous crop? You know, if you were going to recede, uh, is there any issues there with carrier of disease and things like that? And is there any inputs applied to the first crop that may impact a receded crop, such as uh, residual herbicide, nitrogen fertilization? Uh, what's the consequences of receding? What's the effect on the rotation? Do I, is that going to interfere or impact my rotation long term uh, in terms of disease and other issues? Uh, what's the availability of seed for reseeding? Other local growers will be in the same situation, so you may be uh, chasing after the same commodity in a sense, and might be difficult to find some of that some of that uh, seed that you need that, that you're looking for. So that's something else to consider. And also, ultimately, will reseed improve my situation? Is that going to you know basically uh, fix the the problem that I have? So if it's dry and, and nothing's germinating, maybe nothing will change anyway. Uh, receding itself, so be again, before acting on your decision, consider another opinion. Contact your MASC office if you're a contract holder. Adjusters will do a plant count and give you your options, like your plant counts per and what the process to follow is, compensation and future coverage. Uh, you, should con yeah, you should terminate that failed crop, whether it's herbicide or tillage. Uh, I know when moisture is limited like it is this year, We've had some, uh, again, some dry dry period already. Uh, yeah, this spring so far. Uh, yeah, you want to minimize tillage. You want to you, you want to preserve the seed bed that you have and hopefully try and reestablish something as soon as possible using the resources available. And seeding, I uh, recommend to use a higher seeding rate for earlier maturity of whatever plant you're you're going back to. And again, direct seed where possible or prepare the seed bed if necessary. Again, depending on the situation, if you have moisture or not, or you need to preserve that, you want to try and, um, again, uh, seed and provide the best uh, conditions possible for that new crop to emerge and grow. Uh, this is to show here, this is uh, from the Crop Diagnostic School 2017, where we did some, some uh, demonstration using different plant population. And this is on, on hard red spring wheat. And uh, at the 150 plants per square meter versus 250 and 350, we looked at the number of heads per plant. And you can see that, yeah, at the low planting, uh, uh, plant population range, we're at about 3.1 heads per plant. And when we increase the seeding rate to the 350 range, 
uh, we're up just below two heads per per plant, and that's again that's a more uniform crop, and also tends to mature or or, or emerge or head out earlier. And so that's that's one of the things you want is if if you're going to recede the rest, what's left of the season has been is definitely reduced. So you you want to push the crop to uh, to hopefully. Uh, have it mature before actually uh, late season issues happen, such as frost, for instance. Uh, this is a, a, a bad example of a, of a crop. This is a few years ago. The grower was wondering what, what's happening here. This is actually canola. And uh, there were some plants there, but it was really thin. And they thought maybe there was a herbicide issue. Uh, what was happening? I think they may have already done one receiving uh, application or pass. Uh, but the situation kept on happening. So, so I went to look and uh, I actually had a drone with me and I could see some of those white spots into the field here a little further down and, and some closer as well. But from the air, you could clearly see here how the gopher damage and badger issues that basically chewed up that canola crop from one end to the field to the other almost. So basically here, this was a forage then that was terminated the, the year before the issues with gophers were not resolved and so uh, yeah it's like uh, it's like a buffet for those little critters those ground squirrels to to eat so the crop never had a chance to really take off here so in summary again you need to determine the cause of damage uh, what type of germination or crop you have it's an important factor in the recovery process uh, you need to look at assessing the yield potential of the damage stand using established crop charts like you know, with crop insurance Consider the economic implications. And again, I showed you a tool here that's available to look at that. Uh, consider your crop insurance coverage again, uh, ask for another opinion, and again, terminate you the field properly before receding. And that's it for me this morning, Lionel. If there's any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them if I can. Okay, um, I'm gonna quickly just ask Lori if there's any questions. Uh, yes, I have a question. Actually, it's more of a comment um, from David Kaminsky, the pathologist in Carmen. Uh, the comment is the green bridge, seven to 10 days, is from termination to emerge, emergence of new crop that allows time for the vector wheat curl mite to die off. Yeah, okay, good point, yeah. Uh, Basically, uh, I think what Dave's trying to say there, you need to have no growth at all on the field for the mite to be living on before the the new crop uh, emerges, and you need like seven to ten days for that mite to die off. So, uh, yeah, good point, and thanks, Dave. That's uh, good information. Rajan, one question that uh, I've been getting is uh, when we go out to the field and we're checking uh, some of the cereal crops. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, some crop that's in the three to four leaf stage, some crop that's in just emerging, and then some seeds that we got a, a couple tenths of inch of rain here yes, or two days ago, and some of the seeds are just starting to, uh, you know, probably going to emerge here in about three or four days. Um, any comments on what producers should look at doing with a crop like that? Uh, <clears throat> probably I've seen from time to time, not that often, but I, I have seen issues with emergence with cereal. I'm thinking particularly a couple of years ago, I think again, we had a dry spring and it was quite patchy in the field. Uh, some of it had emerged and some of it had not. And uh, so the girl was wondering, should I, should I recede? What should I do with that? And, you know, once you're pushing as late as we are already into June to recede, the cereal is not a great idea because of you, the yield penalty you know, that you would suffer. Uh, some of the crops that's already established, if you have a relatively uniform stand, I'm thinking those crops will, yeah. will take the lead more or less and, compete and potentially outcompete whatever might, might still be coming. So the stand will probably get more dense, which is not necessarily a bad thing but uh, probably would let it go and, and allow whatever is there ahead to, to stay ahead and compete. And, uh, what's coming later might, might cause some delay in, the, in terms of the harvest there, but there will be some kind of a catch up during season time. And I know when the one particular grower that had that situation a couple of years ago and on a good portion of his field, uh, I said, no, it's too late to leave it. And actually there was a bit of rain and more of it came and so on. 
and come harvest time, I asked him what was his yield. And this was, I think it was a, a CPS wheat. I think he harvested 86 bushels to the acre, he told me. So he was quite pleased with the outcome. So not to say it's always going to be the case, but uh, I, I would say I would hold off at this point. Yeah, that's a good comment. I know uh, I've seen it in the past where some of those later emerging uh, plants uh, do tend to catch up. And uh, and and as the season goes on, the crop uh, does uh, does even out. So I like the fact that you put up the uh, a bounce per square foot that producers should be looking at. Uh, that's that was real good information to know as to determining where you're sitting because um, there actually is quite a few plants out there once you get counting them. So uh, that was good information. So uh, thanks, Rajan. Uh, that was good. And what we'll do now, uh, Laurie, is we'll turn it over to John and he's going to give us the update on our flea beetles and cutworms. Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for inviting me on, Lionel. And when Lionel invited me on, he asked me to address some of the questions regarding flea beetles and cutworms that were coming in. So I've. <laughs> A bit of a surprise quiz. So you probably weren't expecting a, a quiz when you uh, came onto the webinar this morning. However, surprise. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to address uh, five questions on cutworms. So these are again questions that are currently coming in. Five on flea beetles. I have started to receive some questions on grasshoppers. So I'm, I want to address those as well real quickly. I do have a bonus question something from our uh, May 15th webinar that um, people have been seeing in the field. So we'll look at that and I'll, re I'll finish up with a bit of a diamondback moth monitoring recap, what we're finding in our traps. So we'll start with our first cutworm question. <clears throat> and this is, where are cutworms in their life cycle? And how do we know when they're going to turn to pupae? And this is a bit of a complicated question because when we talk about cutworms, we're not talking about one species, there's multiple species. Now the two that most people are seeing in their field are dingy and redback cutworm. So dingy cutworm on the uh, right side of your screen, they overwinter as a partially grown larva. They're quite large right now, so they should be turning to pupa really soon, uh, probably within the next week or so. Now. As a guideline, we suggest if, if dingy cutworm is your dominant species and most are larger than an inch, they will be pupating very soon. And that's sort of the cutoff point where unless you've got a very heavy population, you might be better just to ride it out. Um, a lot of their damage will be done already. Now, redback cutworm on the left of your screen, they overwinter as an egg. and when the eggs are laid the previous fall, it's done over quite a long period of time. It's not all in the same week. Uh, so emergence in the spring is very staggered. And I know with the redback cutworm populations, people are finding still a lot of young cutworms, and they're also finding some fully grown ones. Um, I have had a couple people send me pictures of the pupa. So on the right of your screen, the two brown uh, cocoons, those are what the cutworm pupae look like. And again, um, both dingy and rat, redback would be starting to pupate. D dingy, however, should be mainly large larva. Redback, there's going to be a mixture. So if it's mainly redback, do you have, if you're finding a lot that are still under an inch and you've got what looks like an economic population, that's where the insecticide may be beneficial. If they're mainly greater than an inch, they're pupating soon. And again, unless it's a severe situation, you can probably ride it out. So question number two on cutworms. Will uh, cutworms feed below ground or above ground? And that's also a very complicated question because it depends on the species. And just as a, a bit of a recap here, we've got we, there's a lot of different species of cutworms, and we put them into roughly four different groups. There's one group we call the subterranean cutworms. This group feeds almost entirely below the surface. And these are things like glassy cutworm and pale western cutworm. 
luckily species we don't have a lot of, um, when they're the dominant species, they will do a lot of clipping because they're feeding below ground mainly. Then there's the, the tunnel dwellers. They make a tunnel for themselves. They live in the tunnel. They will cut plants, pull them into their tunnel and feed on them. Um, we don't have a lot of these either. Black cutworm would be an example of these. Um, if you're looking up things on Google about cutworms, you'll get a ton of stuff on black cutworm from the Corn Belt in the US. That's one of their dominant species as black cutworm. And it's a tunnel dweller, but that species isn't dominant here. So again, we don't deal with them a lot. Then you have the surface feeders like redback cutworm in the photo. They will come out of the ground, feed, do a lot of their feeding along the surface. So very young seedlings and they will clip stems. And then you have a fourth group, the climbing cutworms. They come out of the soil and they prefer to climb up onto the plants and chomp on the leaves and won't do as much cutting. So uh, again, our dominant species here in Manitoba, redback cutworm, it's a surface feeder. It'll come out of the ground, it will feed above the ground. So plants, uh, Rajan talked about plants where uh, the growing point is below the surface. Uh, some of those plants may not be affected as much by things like redback, dark-sided and dingy cutworm. Uh, plants where the growing point is above ground, if that plant is cut, it's going to be a dead plant. It's not going to regrow. So our dominant species here, again, redback, dark-sided, dingy, those are our top three species. They're primarily surface feeders. However, dingy cutworm will climb on plants, chomp on leaves, and then go back in the soil, and doesn't do nearly as much cutting as redbacked will. So if you're seeing a lot of um, seeding, but not a lot of cutting, dig around the plants. My guess is you'll have more dingy cutworm than redbacks in that population. And again, some less common ones that we can find here, but aren't as abundant. Glassy and pale western cutworm. This is a glassy cutworm in my photo. It's a cereal specialist. They like cereals. So um, often we see them in the forage cereals. It seems that if you have perennial cereals, perennial grasses, they like to get in there and they'll, they'll build up. Once or twice I've seen them in corn and wheat doing a lot of damage. But again, not as common. But they are a sub a below ground feeder so when they're the dominant species you will get a lot of below ground feeding and they're very hard to control with insecticide just because you can't get the product to them so question three on cutworms this is a multiple choice so which of the following could explain live cutworms still present in a field the day after applying an insecticide so resistance to the insecticide rate was not high enough some insects were molting or all of the above. And technically any of these, the top three are possible. The more likely one is, assuming you've used a good rate, the more likely one is some insects were molting. This is a very common cause of cutworms still being alive the day after you've uh, sprayed with insecticide. And so what's happening here is uh, cutworm larvae to grow, they have, they've got a hard skeleton um, outside their body called their cuticle. They have to shed that cuticle to grow to the next stage. And that period where they're getting ready to shed the cuticle, shedding it, and initially developing the new one, that's called molting. Uh, it can happen for a day or two. And in that period, they're not feeding at all. So they'll be in the ground, not feeding. So if you go and you apply an insecticide and they're in a molt, the next day they could still be live cutworms in the soil because they just weren't feeding that night. Um, it might even go into a second evening. After that, they should get killed. All our products do have enough residual that you will get those molting cutworms when they do resume feeding. But there can be a lot of cutworms in that molt. Uh, project in Alberta, they found that uh, in their study, 20 to 50 percent of the population of pale western cutworm in some of their fields were in this pre-molt or recently post-molt um, stage and were not feeding. So uh, it can be a significant amount. And uh, in the laboratory study, basically the same project, they showed that molting period uh, comprised about 33 percent of the life um, stages of the larvae. So um, can there can be quite a bit doing this. So again, don't be surprised if you find the odd cutworm alive the day after your spray. 
So question number four for cutworms, can some plants compensate for cutworm feeding? We've kind of addressed this one already. Uh, the short answer is yes, some can and some can't or won't as well. Now, even those plants that are being um, chewed off at the ground level and die, uh, there isn't this ratio where if 5% of your plants are killed, it means 5% yield loss, or 10% plants killed equals 10% yield loss. That doesn't always apply. And I'll use the example of canola, a study done in Manitoba. Uh, they removed canola plants, and they calculated what their actual yield loss was versus expected yield loss based on the number of plants they removed. And what they found was that when they removed canola plants, uh, the remaining plants produced more pods, and the, the pod production increased from 20 to 90 plants to as many as 600 uh, pods on a plant. It's almost hard to imagine 600 pods on a plant, but that's what they report in their study anyway. And in some instances, uh, more seeds per pod and increased seed weight uh, was in uh, the, the plants that were remaining. So uh, crops like canola, flax, um, and there's several other crops, they have this ability to, the remaining plants will fill in and produce more when some plants go missing. Now, there's going to be a point where the remaining plants can't compensate well enough for plant removal. So as Rajan pointed out, you have to look at the plant stand and use that calculator and you can uh, basically use some of those same principles to make your decisions whether you want to reseed or, or spray for cutworms in this case. So cutworm question five, which may affect how deep cutworms are in the soil during the day? And this is something that people have been asking a little bit about because with the dry weather, they are going deep. So there's a bit of a clue for you. Um, stage or instar of the cutworm, how moist the soil is, or whether an agronomist has been looking for them or not. One Number one or two of the above or don't know. And uh, the, the answer is number one and number two. They can both explain how deep cutworms are in the soil. They will not go deeper just because you're looking for them. So depth in the soil. So usually young larvae do spend more time uh, closer to the soil surface. Usually they're within the first, uh, say 10 to 15 millimeters of the soil when they're younger. So now when they're younger, they're also harder to look for. They're, they're tinier, but you don't have to dig as deep. When they get to be older larvae, if it's dry soil, they'll go down easily uh, 10 to 15, uh, 8 to 10 centimeters, so 3 to 4 inches from the soil surface. If it's wetter, they're likely to be closer to the soil surface. If it's drier, they will likely go deeper. They still will come out at night and feed, even when they're deep like that. Um, they'll just go deeper when they go back in the soil the next day to get to where the moisture is. And if there's any other cutworm questions, we can deal with them um, in the question period later. Those are some of the top ones I've been getting. But again, if there's other ones, I'd be glad to entertain them later. So on to our bonus question. I put this right in the middle of the presentation. And it's something we um, addressed last week. We had a picture of a almost transparent white worm that is in the soil. And I did have a photo sent to me yesterday from somebody asking about it. And I've had a couple of questions the past week on these little white worms. So if you have a good memory, you might recall these are enchitrid worms. And enchitrid worms, they are often abundant in soils with a lot of trash and stubble. They're decomposers. They like to feed on decomposing plant material, fungi, bacteria. Um, so they're good things. Don't worry about them. They're not wire worms. We covered that the last webinar. Wire worms look very different and have legs. So chitrid worms. Okay, so on to the flea beetle questions. So uh, one of the questions that uh, is forefront to a lot of people's minds right now is, uh, at what stage do I need to stop worrying about the flea beetles on my canola? And the answer to this is actually based in uh, an older study from the 80s and a newer study that is being still being done actually at the University of Manitoba. Um, the older research found that yield was reduced most when plants were damaged in the seedling and even in those first and second true leaf stages. But once you got three to four true leaves on the plant, 
the plants generally can compensate for remaining flea beetle damage. The study that's going on at the University of Manitoba, it's actually an economic threshold study, but their preliminary results tend to back this up, that once you get three to four true leaves on the plant, usually the plants are good to go. It, the challenge is getting there. So that's what we're dealing with right now is because it's been so dry, just getting the plants to that stage. The flea beetle question two, how does seeding date relate to, relate to flea beetle injury? So does earlier seeding result in less flea beetle injury or does later seeding? And this is actually a complicated question. So actually, regard, regardless of how you answer this, you could be right depending on the environmental conditions that year. There's been several studies where they've looked at seeding dates and flea beetle injury. Um, there's one that was done in Manitoba found that the earlier seeded plants suffered more flea beetle damage than later seeded plants. And at North Dakota study, same thing, the earlier season, uh, earlier seeding increased injury by flea beetles. And in Alberta, they did a study where they got mixed results. The earlier seeding reduced flea beetle seeding in southern Alberta, but increased it in central and northern Alberta. Um, a lot will depend on really how quickly your plants can get from seed to three to four leaf stage. If it's going to take any more than three weeks, you're you're at greater risk of getting a lot of flea beetle injury and potentially doing some full year sprays. So it, it it's almost hit and miss because of the weather. This year, people I think were making very good decisions. Some people were actually delaying seeding dates just to try to take advantage of this. Um, information, but with dry weather, the plants can still sit there for us and um, not develop. If we had got some timelier rains, uh, it might have helped out the situation a little bit. So seeding date, it can be tricky depending on environmental conditions. So another question I've had this week uh, from a couple of people is, does reduced tillage reduce flea beetles? Or reduce flea beetle damage, I guess, is what I should put there. Uh, there is data to suggest that reduced tillage can help reduce flea beetle feeding. It won't eliminate it. You will still get flea beetle feeding. It may not be quite as great. And there's actually been three different studies to back this up. Um, the one by Milbraith et al, that was in North Dakota. And the one by Dawes et al, down in Alberta. The Bostrep one was actually here in Manitoba. It's an older study. Uh, but all of them did show that uh, damage was less in their zero till plot compared to their conventional plots. So these were plot studies. And what they figured was happening was the zero till was creating a less favorable environment for the flea beetles. Flea beetles, there's three things they really like. They like hot, dry, and calm conditions to feed under. So I think the conventional till fields, they, at least for those first two, uh, hot and dry. Uh, they kind of fit the bill a bit better. Uh, having a lot of stubble in the field probably creates a bit of a damper, maybe a bit cooler environment. So uh, less appealing to flea beetles. We have seen this at the university farm this year as well, just anecdotally. Um, my plots this year at the farm were seeded into stubble. And just coincidentally, there's some plots just a little ways away that are into some heavily tilled soil. And they've been sprayed already for foliar sprayed for flea beetles. They certainly had a lot more damage than uh, the plots and the, the trash were receiving. And uh, again, they're very close together, so it made a nice comparison for us. Okay, uh, next question on flea beetles. Name three seeding practices that can reduce the risk of flea beetles in canola. So, one is to seed as shallow as available moisture will allow in dry years. It is tricky because people want to see deeper to get to see to where moisture is. But again, your goal is to get the plant from um, seed in the ground to three to four leaf stage quickly. So if you seed too deep, it might uh, spread out that period a bit more. We've already covered uh, direct seeding. So I, I, I put that in with a seeding practice. It's really a tillage thing, but um, yeah, that microclimate created by direct seeding might reduce flea beetle feeding. And the other one I'll put in is increasing seeding rate, which 
I realize isn't always practical. Canola seed is expensive, and the trend has been to go with uh, lower, not higher, seeding rates. Um, now, this does get us into a dilemma because lower seeding rates mean less plants for the same population of flea beetles, so it might concentrate the feeding a bit more. Um, and uh, sometimes you can get more flea beetle feeding if you have a thinner stand, again, more per plant. So increasing seeding rate can help, um, but again, it, it may not always be practical for people. Okay, another flea beetle question, and we looked at this one in the May 15th webinar as well. Um, scouting for defoliation is a tricky thing, and it's subjective. It's both an art and a science, I guess. So the codeline that you have on the picture here, the question would be, what percent defoliation is this? And if most of your codelines look like this, do you spray? Well, the answer is this is 25% defoliation. So this is the point where we recommend uh, if on average your plants look like this, this is the break even. Well, it's not really the break even point. It's the point where we recommend you spray. The break even point, 50% even looks a lot worse than this. That's where your yield loss is going to essentially equal your insecticide cost, but 50% is a very high amount of feeding. And flea beetles feed so quickly, we don't want you waiting to that point. So 25%, what you see here, that's the threshold point. When things start to look like this on average, it's worth spraying. If it's not quite this level yet, you might be able to hold on, especially if you've got some true leaves developing, you might be able to hold on and get through. But that's the break-even point. And once again, if you have other flea beetle questions, uh, hopefully we'll have a few minutes after I finish up and we can address uh, further questions. So one of the questions I've been getting the last couple of days is uh, grasshoppers are starting to now emerge and people are starting to see them along their field edges. And in a couple of cases, people have been noticing quite a few along their field edges and wondering, is it too early to be spraying the field edges for grasshoppers if we're starting to notice them? So my general answer to this is yes, it is too early. Um, on the upper left in your screen is the eggs. They have started to hatch, but most grasshoppers are still going to be in the egg stage. So what you see out there now is probably just a fraction of what will be there. When they first hatch out, they're like the one on this penny here. They're about the size of a wheat kernel. They do not move far. They do not do nearly as much feeding. Um, so they will not move a great distance in those very early instars. So if they're heavily concentrated along your field edge, um, they may move into those first few rows. Keep an eye on things. There are exceptions to my general rule. If you are starting to lose a lot of crop along those outer edges, you it might be worthwhile to go in with an insecticide, especially one with a, a longer residual and just do a pass along that field edge. But do realize there's a lot more eggs. So if you can hold on till later in June, you will probably get away with one pass versus possibly having to go out a second time. So usually the ideal time for treating grasshoppers is late June, early July. Early June is usually a bit too early, again, just because most of the eggs haven't hatched yet. On the um, bottom right of the screen, this grasshopper is not an adult. You can see these wing buds on its back, so it still cannot fly. So this would be a, um, a fifth instar nymph. So they go through five stages as juveniles before they become an adult. When they get to be their older juvenile stages, they have these very visible wing buds. The next stage beyond this is adult, and that's where they can actually fly, and they will move. Uh, from the ditches if they're heavily concentrated into your fields. So you you want to be targeting your spray for kind of the, the, the mid-stage nymph when they're in the third or fourth stage. And certainly once you start seeing some with wing buds like this, if there's a very heavy population around that field edge, uh, that's a good time to be treating them. Don't wait till they're adults if the population is very heavy. And maybe to wrap up, I'll show some diamondback moth data. So this is uh, data as of yesterday's when I typed this in. 
There's a couple of trends here I'll, I'll just uh, point out that are interesting. You'll notice in the Northwest, uh, Bozeman, we had a, a trap count up to 98, and most of these were in their trap last week. So there seems to have been a population that blew in and got dumped somewhere in the Northwest last week. Uh, Dauphin 26, that's not a terribly high number. 98, when we start seeing numbers like that, um, we just caution people, start looking. Um, it's very interesting that our highest counts in the southwest are still very low, 12 and 8, and eight for our high counts. Um, so these are the highest counts in each of the regions. What can happen is when diamondback moths are being blown in on their weather systems, um, it usually takes uh, an event like a rain or some sort of weather event to bring them out of the wind currents and down to the ground. And so that they're not, they don't always arrive in the more southerly locations first. Some years they will be dumped in the interlake or the northwest, the east, wherever the wind currents and patterns bring them in and dump them. So it's very unpredictable. You, they, they can be very patchy. There can be hot spots and other areas that have next to none. So um, people in the northwest, up in that Bozeman area, it'll be a good idea probably in about a week or so. If the adults just arrived this past week, uh, another week or so would be good to just start looking for larvae. We've had many years where we've had high trap counts and the larvae just don't appear. Uh, there's a parasitic wasp called diadegma that also gets blown in with the diamondback moth. If we have lots of diadegma, you can get lots of diamondbacks, but then nothing much develops because they're parasitizing the larva. Um, bad weather can sometimes kill off the diamondbacks. So, uh, the trap counts are more as a warning to scout in areas where traps are high, but it doesn't, um, there's certainly no guarantee that there will be an outbreak in those areas. The only other high ER count I'll point out, Steinbach area, that trap count has been developing for a couple of weeks into this higher level, so that's another area where we may have to keep an eye on things. So I'll end with that. And hopefully we've got a few minutes left for any other questions people might have. Hi, John. I do have actually a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, have you seen or heard any reports of flea beetles building a tolerance or resistance to any insecticides? For example, Delta Methrin. Is there any testing being done? Um, I'm not aware of any testing being done this year. There has been testing in the past. And the short answer is no, there is no evidence of there being resistance to the pyrethroid group. Um, it's something that probably should be evaluated um, again uh, because the pyrethroid group is so heavily used for flea beetles. Um, my gut, well, it's possible there could be pyrethroid resistance, but there's been no scientific test to prove it at this point. I, and I know that pyrethroid group, some people are saying it works great. Pyrethroids, I mean desis, pounce, matador. They're all pyrethroids, so if you get resistance to one, you're likely going to have resistance to the whole group of them. Um, a lot of people are using them. They don't work as well when the temperatures are high, for one thing. And I think this year what's happening is the flea beetle population is heavy enough that people are using them. and a few days later, you've had another wave of flea beetles that have moved into the field, and it might appear like the product didn't work, but I think it might be more your field is being reinvaded um, over a period of a few days. And the, the only products that have been verified to that flea beetles can be, I'll say, tolerant to, not resistant to, are the neonicotinoids. Striped flea beetle is definitely more tolerant to the neonix than the crucifer, but it's not a case of resistance where there's been a genetic change. They're just more tolerant to the chemical. Okay, another one here. Your study about cutworm feeding was done in 1987. What are your thoughts with current canola hybrids and current seeding rates moving to four pounds or less? Any studies being planned for the future so, we're, so we are not 35 years old? That's actually an excellent question. Now that study uh, at the University of Manitoba, what they were doing in that study was actually physically simulating damage and clipping plants um, and looking how things responded. Uh, 
I agree. We we it'd be nice to have a modern version of that study just to compare the current hybrids. In fact, a lot of our threshold work and um, uh, I guess feeding damage studies probably could be or should be redone, reevaluated with the modern hybrids because things in general do seem um, some of the the hybrids are so robust and vigorous that I think they probably, my gut feeling is they probably can compensate even better than some of the older hybrids can. So very good point. Some of those st studies are very outdated and do need more work and it's uh, information that we should be passing on to the University of Manitoba and Ag Canada to maybe try to get some of that research happening. And just I'll put it a side point here since we talked about diamondback moth, uh, a nominal threshold that's very old and I'm very skeptical of. Um, there is a study that is being started this year to reevaluate the diamondback moth threshold, which again is nominal, with our modern hybrids. So okay, I have another. I have another one here. Does seeding time also impact on flea beetle damage? Um, well, seeding time. We kind of went over that a little bit. It's it's a hit and miss thing. The the studies that were done in North Dakota and Manitoba showed there was more flea beetle damage with the earlier seeding, less with the later seeding. But as Meth mentioned, it's a hit and miss thing because really what matters is how quickly that plant goes from seeding date until three to four leaf stage. And even later seeding doesn't always guarantee that will happen quickly. Better odds, but you get a year like this year where it's very dry and you still can end up doing a lot of foliar spraying. Okay, the last one here. Is anyone planning for diamond um, back moth traps in the Cirrus area or further southwest? Yes, our network is spread right across the province and there are a number of traps in the southwest. I only showed the top two counts for every region just to show you what the highest numbers were in each region. So the southwest, your highest counts were 12 and 8. Yes, the short answer is yes, there are traps in that Cirrus region. I just didn't show them because their counts are very low at their, at their current time. Um, we do have our raw data. Um, we'll, it'll be posted online and in our uh, Manitoba uh, crop pest update, which will be coming out later today. Okay, that's all I have for right now. Okay, awesome. John, uh, I've got uh, one question for you regarding flea beetles. Uh, one of the questions I get a fair bit is, is or do they cycle, like is their cycle going to end here or is there a, you know, besides plants so growing them, are, there, are they going to mature and, and just be gone and don't show up again till fall or, or, is just, or is that something we could look at? Okay, yeah, uh, actually excellent question because I talked about cutworm cycles and how uh, once they turn to a pupa, they're done for the year, we don't see them again, and how they molt as they're uh, feeding on the plants being pests. So the way cutworms work is uh, they overwinter as adults. So the, the adult flea beetles you see now are the exact same adult flea beetles that were present last fall. So being adults, they're not molting, they're just feeding, so there's no interruption in molting phase. But being beetles that um, emerged last fall, they start dying out in June and uh, probably, now this year I think with the earlier cooler weather, their cycle might be a bit delayed compared to where it normally is. Normally by about mid-June, we really see a significant decrease in flea beetle population happening and by late June, they're getting very low, uh, almost gone. So uh, we might be delayed a little bit this year. So I'm expecting maybe for the next week, maybe two weeks, the population might still be fairly strong, but once we start getting into the last two weeks in June, you should start to be seeing much uh, reduced flea beetle populations. They're dying out. They've laid their eggs in the soil and then died off. What will happen is those eggs will hatch. They feed on the roots. They don't do a lot of damage by feeding on the roots. It's pretty much inconsequential. And then you'll get another batch of adult flea beetles that come out in August and um, into early September. Those will be the flea beetles that will be present for next year. 
So it's one complete cycle in their life. You see the adults twice, late season and the next spring. Okay, well, that's good. And, and I guess the other positive is anybody that is receding, uh, a lot of that canola is up in four to five days and uh, it's gonna have a fair bit of seed treatment on it. So it'll be able to defend itself for a while as it gets into that two to three leaf stage as well. Hopefully that'll be the case, yes. Uh, but it's, I would still keep an eye on things the, in case the flea beetles are overwhelming it. But yes, you, anyone reseeding your seed treatment should be good until the flea beetle population starts uh, dropping off. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks again, John and Rajon, for uh, coming on today. Uh, kind of a couple things that have been uh, affecting producers over the past week. And uh, Lori, I see we're uh, right up against 10 o'clock here. So I think it's a good time just to uh, end the webinar now. And uh, we'll have a more complete update next week when we uh, meet again. So thanks everybody for attending.